Good afternoon. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So my presentation will be short. Um, I'm speaking on four thematic areas uh, about Petroleum Hard Development Corporation. So Petroleum Hard Development Corporation is a statutory corporation set up by an act of parliament with Act 1053 with a mandate under Section 2 is to promote and develop petroleum and petrochemical hub in Ghana. And in Ghana is where we've located a place in the western region known as Jomro to be able to set up what I'm going to talk about. So the vision of the president in 2017 was clearly made to the Ministry of Energy to be able to develop a modern, diversified, efficient, and financial sustainable energy economy that ensures that all Ghanaian homes and industries have access to adequate, reliable, affordable, and environmentally sustainable supply of energy to meet the needs and to support the accelerated growth and development agenda as the country envisage. So out of this, that gave birth to the Petroleum Hub. As I said, this is a statutory corporation. So it's more of a PPP by innovative way, trying, government is now trying to do things right and then bring in an invest, investors to rather come and develop it. So it's a government-led by private sector development. So our vision is simple, is to be the petroleum hub of choice because there are a lot of petroleum hubs across the globe. And our mission is to promote and develop a competitive, sustainable, and enabling environment for investment within the midstream and downstream sector in Ghana. Why? Because when you come to Ghana, it's all about upstream and downstream, and we don't have a proper midstreamer. And so this petrol hub is going to build a proper midstreamer in Ghana, so Ghana become a vertically integrated oil and gas country. So the upstream is running, the midstream is running, and the downstream is running as well. Our core values are four. We have safety, ethics, professionalism and sustainability. Safety, we all know within oil and gas, safety is very key because with the least mistake or negligence, you are out of business. And ethics because most of the time, people crit criticize the government sector with service deliverables or service delivery. And what we're trying to do is that we have to be ethical in what we do with our investors and also very professional because it's the private sector that is bringing this 60 billion to develop. Their eight o'clock is eight o'clock. Seven o'clock is seven o'clock. Once you delay them, you are out of business. So we have going to add it to our core values so that staff working within the corporation understand why we exist. And sustainability here is not our usual English sustainability, but it's the current campaign, energy transition. We have also taken it on board because we don't want to say we are not aware of what is happening. So what are we supposed to do? Our approach to sustainability is, is simple. We have two pillars in dealing with sustainability. One, we are saying that in as much as this project is going to impact our economy, we are mindful of our environment. And that is why we take sustainability very seriously. And the second pillar is that we want to empower our people through what we call the local content maximization and gender integration. Sorry. So there are activities, about nine activities that we've put in place to ensure that we take sustainability seriously. But with time, I want to proceed. Now, when the president said he want Ghana to be the Rotterdam of Africa or want Ghana to be the energy provider for the continent, was it just a mere statement he made during when he took office in 2017 or it was backed by data? If you look at this slide, in 2021, the ECOWAS region, which is the sub-region of West Africa, consumed 43 million metric ton. Here we're looking at petrol, diesel, LPG, jet fuel, and kerosene. I mean, average five of this product. And Nigeria happens to be the biggest consumer with 53%, followed by Ghana, uh, Senegal, Ivory Coast, Togo, and the rest of the countries doing 21%. Fast forward 2022, it jumped to 45.2, with the same consumption pattern, Nigeria leading. And then just last year, it, it dropped 44. 6 million metric ton. Why? Because there was a lot of price hikes. People started parking their cars, joining their colleagues to work, and that was the reduction. We took Ghana as a case study to look at year on year in terms of consumption patterns. Even in the midst of COVID, 
we never stop consuming. So it tells you that we are not going to stop consuming petroleum products. And you can see the only drop in 2022, as I said, because of price hikes, people started parking their vehicles. But the bigger question here is, where are we getting all this product to consume? About 56% are coming from Northwest Europe, which is Rotterdam. And even amongst ourselves as Africans, we are trading 15%. So if you take 15% from 100, we have 85%. That is a huge market for this hub to take advantage of. And that is why we are here to speak to investors that the demand is there. And we've all seen the data. <laughs> we wake up again, the same president has gone to champion that Africa continental free trade should be hosted in Accra, Ghana. And because Africa is becoming one, we are looking at about 1.3 billion uh, market and 3.3 trillion combined GDP. So we need to think as an implementer or as an agency, not to also only look at the ECOWAS market, but look at the continent. What is the continent looking at? The whole of Africa in 2016 consumed approximately 82 million metric ton, and was projected that by 2030, Africa is going to consume around 148 million metric ton. But the catch here is that year on year to grow by 7%. If you check the data year on year, it's growing more than 7%. So it's either by 2030, it's going to quadruple, it's going to double, and that's the data for you. Same as petrochemicals. Petrochemicals is worse because if you look at the map of Africa, it's in the negative, so it's coming down, meaning everything petrochemicals is either imported what is the primary focal point when it comes to petrochemical as fertilizer? Because most of Africa countries are agrarian and they depend on fertilizer. So what we've done here is we are looking at what is the data with respect to fertilizer. About six million metric ton year on year is, or every year in 2021 is what is happening. So there's a huge market. We also what happened between the Ukraine and Russian war. We took the same case study for Ghana year on year, what is happening. Then someone will ask you, your production is dropping, and you say you want to do petroleum hub, because now Ghana is doing less than 200,000 a barrel per day. But Singapore has proven to all of us that you don't need to have a drop of crude to be able to do a hub. What you need is a strategic location, and Ghana has it. We are in the middle of the world, and we are closer to every country. Anyway, we are lucky we have crude. So we decided to do this uh, analysis in Africa to see our oil production as well as the gas production. We can see 7.4 million barrel per day and 22.9 BCF per day in terms of gas. If you take Ghana, that people are criticizing. <laughs> you don't, your production is dropping, but you want to do a half, which I've spoken about it. The good news is that Right now, GMPC, which is the NOC of the state, has a company known as Esploco. It's doing the biggest assessment now. They are doing the 3D ass uh, assessment, which, cover, which is onshore. So from the Volta region to the northern region is a discovery of oil onshore. And it's going to be the biggest. And you can see the data. And that is currently what they've set up, they set up this a subsidiary known as the Esploco, GMPC Esploco, to actually dedicate their time on this onshore project. So these are all projects coming on, on stream very soon. Now, this is the data for Africa in terms of our capacity and refinery. If you look at this slide, it tells you that in terms of our capacity, we have 3.6 million barrel per day in terms of all our refineries in Africa. But if you check on your left, our consumption is 3.5, meaning we are doing excess than what we need in terms of demand. But is that the case? No. If you go further, our throughput is 1.83. There's a deficit of 1.67. That is where we import. Now, people are saying this project is ambitious and you don't have demand. But this is a 2020 data. What it means is that if you, ask Dan, if you add Dangote's 650 plus Ghana 900,000 and Centio maximum is 100, so that Ghana is going to do 1 million plus Dangote, that's 650, it will still be left 
with a deficit. So as of today, 2024, even holding population constant, as of 2020 data, there's a deficit with what mm -hmm. the petroleum hub is going to do, plus Dangote coming on stream with full capacity, there will still be a deficit. So it means that demand is there. What we need is the regulatory framework and the good policies for investors to come in to support us build this hub. This slide is telling us that we do not have a hub in Africa. And if you look at Europe, America, Asia, and the uh, Middle East, they all have. So what we are championing now is if you're able to do this through Ghana, then there's going to be a hub for Africa. What do we do? We are building three refineries with a capacity of 300,000 barrels per stream day, and we are building five petrochemical plants with a capacity of 90,000 barrels per stream day. We are looking at storage capacity of 10 million cubic meters, and then two major jetties with multiple beds. So this is the key infrastructure, and this is, and the investment model here is build on and operate. We want to depart from government participation that derails or delay projects, and the popular word is carry me, 10%, 20%, you go and plan with your 80%, you come back and government say, we don't have money, so carry us. If you have told me earlier on, I would have planned with 100% and carry you. So this is what we've seen is delaying projects in Africa. So now this project is very unique. Come in, you build, and you own. It's a 50-year contract that we give, the land lease, and then after that, you, you're able to renew for additional 20 years. These are the ancillaries. Under the ancillaries, we are looking at a joint venture. Why joint venture? Because these are common usage. Most of the times, too, on the investment side, investors want to be <laughs> To, to monopolize certain things to their advantage. So government wants to stay in there as a JV and be able to take decision where there's going to be a monopoly. So it's a minimum 10% JV when it comes to the ancillary side so that there will be smooth run or smooth flow within the enclave. Now, this is the land, 20,000 acre land that government has gone in to secure. Why so? Because this is the most difficult thing in Africa to secure land. And uh, in, the, in, in terms of the PPP arrangement, government decided to go in for the land and then lease it out to investors to be able to do their work. So all that we are looking out for is the EPC plus F. And you take your own decision. Government is not going to worry about your decision and delay even coming to meetings late so that you can be able to run and run effectively. A beautiful work has been done to know where each of these facilities I've already mentioned is going to be situated. It's just indicative. Once you come on board and you decide that you want to get closer to the coastline or even to reclaim the coastline, we will sit down with you and agree. And then so far as both parties are okay, we move on. So this is how the whole land is going to be declared as a free zone now. People call it special economy zones. And what are the incentives? On your left or my left is what everybody enjoys in Ghana, so far as we are operating in Ghana. But on, on my right is... Once you're operating in the hub, there's going to be 100% tax exemption duties and levies. You're going to get corporate tax holidays for 10 years. And after that, you pay 15% instead of 25% within the downstream. You are also going to get exemption from withholding tax, which is 8% paying your uh, equity holders. So that is also a good thing. And there's no restriction when it comes to repatriation of funds. But what we require you to do is to sit down with our central bank to plan so that we know when you are moving X amount of dollars out and when you want to also plow back. So this is what we have as an incentive to investors. Because of the huge nature of the project, we face them into threat. We don't want anybody to come in, hijack the entire project, and if there's any unforeseen circumstance, the project does not become successful. So we have phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one has already been taken on the 18th of June this year. We signed an agreement. That's the project agreement and land lease agreement that I spoke about, which is estimated to cost 12 billion. And now phase two and phase three are available. Phase two, 27 billion USD, and phase three, 21 billion USD. The items or the, the facilities or the infrastructure I mentioned is what we've shared out here. What we've done, each of these, phases are independent. 
Why? Because we want any of these faith that is that takes off gives you the hub concept because we've, we've said that we are trying to monetize our strategic location that we are in the middle of the world. And I've already spoken about the project cost, which is the 60 billion, which we saw in the earlier slide, 20, 12, 27, 21. Now, we can't only do the project alone. We need to also remember that all work and no place. So there are other echo system around that we want to also bring on board. The, the location already has existing um, um, infrastructure like Inzulezu village. They've lived in this water for 50 years, 100 years, and we want to take advantage of that. There's Ankasa Games Reserve, so those who love nature can also visit there after work. And there are beautiful signs in that is showing the festival on the 18th. I'm joining them to celebrate their major Kundum festival. All right, so why do you want to come to Ghana to invest? We'll look at it, but this is one of the strengths in terms of the petroleum hub we have. We believe that there's low political risk in Ghana, and we can all attest to the fact that since 1992 that we decided to be a democratic state, nothing has happened. We've changed government in, out, in, here, and there, and we are still forging ahead, and everybody can say Ghana is very, very, very okay to, to do business with. There's assured return on investment. If the project, the petroleum project, if you do the ROI, the numbers are scary, and I don't think you can get those numbers anywhere, and we believe that is what is our strength. Access to vibrant shipping routes, access to deep water, very important because where we are located, it ranges between 16 to 27 in terms of the depth of our water, which is above international standard because it's able to accommodate all manner of vessels, especially the VLCC, the very large crude carriers and the ultra large crude carriers. So to us, it's an advantage. And the immediate availability of the 20,000 acres of land because in other jurisdictions, they have to reclaim their sea to be able to do such projects. And it's going to impact our country and create 780,000 jobs to our team in youth. And that is what we are, I mean, now government interest is job creation and the taxes and not decision making at boardrooms. Okay, so why invest in Ghana? And when we meet like this, we need to also market aside the petroleum hub, Ghana, and we can all attest to the fact that uh, Ghana is in a large regional domestic and, and regional market. So we're looking at 35 billion retail market. We have ECOWAS and we have the AFTA I spoke about. Business friendly environment. Even yesterday, our vice president launched what we call the citizen app. Now you can just pay your taxes, everything that you registering your business is going to be very easy for us. So we are also uh, getting there. One of the things people want to come to Ghana is because of the high school labor that we have. Now everybody is going to school because of the free SHS policy. You will not get any child on the street or at home trying to do your cleaning for you. So every day people are being schooled. And so getting people to work for you with a little training, they are there to support you. So that is one thing. And I spoke about the strategic location. We are in the middle of the world and it helps us in terms of trading. In terms of stable democracy and rule of law, we are first in West Africa and second in Africa. And abundant natural resource, I don't think I can mention them. We have everything. Those days when it rains, your grandma will tell you to go out. When you go out, we pick something yellow. We didn't know it was gold. We come and give it to them and go and sell. So that is the country we are talking about. We have everything in there. This is our roadmap since 2021, <coughs> September. We are Zoomed office. What we've done so far and what we are doing is what is being shown. So I'll urge you, whatever I've said, we have a two minutes video to narrate it. Thank you.
presentation. Um, I believe that we, we've had our appetites <laughs> whetted for what's to come. We have an incredible panel um, today. We want to look at why invest in Ghana. We want to look at the investment climate as well as doing business in Ghana. So I'd like to just um, introduce our panelists. Um, so we have Charles who is joining us. And then next person, I'd like to invite Mr. Michael Edemakafia. Um, he's a legal practitioner with more than two decades of experience. He's currently the vice president for external affairs for gold sales. Um, that's a foreign investment in Ghana. <laughs> And um, he's also currently president of the Ghana Chamber of Mines. And then um, he's also co-founded a legal um, company called Landmark Legal in Accra. Next person, I'd like to introduce Jeremy Kwenu. Um, he was recently named the Young FinTech Leader of the Year. Um, he's an experienced digital finance professional with over a decade of experience in banking and FinTech. He champions initiatives that connect traditional financial institutions with the future of digital finance. He's currently the CEO of Jumo Ghana and the general manager of Jumo Africa. Next in line, I'd like to introduce Kwapena. Oh, so Jay. Jay. Oh, so Jay. Oh, yeah. a good presentation. Well done. Thank you. Big one. Yes. So Kwabna is the chief investment officer for Third Way Capital, an investment company investing in SMEs in Ghana, Kenya, and South Africa. He started his career of G Capital's infrastructure project finance um, team. And then prior to Third Way Capital, he was senior investment officer with ACA Ghana. It's also an oil and gas, right? Aka, yes. Okay, and then we didn't have the final. Okay, I think that should be my seat. Thank you very much. We'll dive straight into the. Okay. Right. Let me just. So I'll start with Kwabna since you're close to me. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like for you to share with us um, investment opportunities in Ghana. You have worked with SMEs a lot, and one of the first impediments for SMEs, MSMEs, is access to finance. Would you want to give us some insights? Um, yeah, sure. So, um, in simple terms, access to finance is one of many headwinds that I think SMEs in Ghana face. Um, as you know, um, at my last check, I believe the currency is depreciated almost 33% year to date. Um, don't worry, I, it gets better from here. It's, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, so, that is, the, the, that is definitely a challenge, um, and that's where companies like ours and you know, funds like ours can play a role um, in providing capital. Today, if you're going to the bank to borrow in Ghana, you're, you're paying a fair amount of, um, in terms of interest, the interest rates north of 30 is un, it's not uncommon, and some of our companies are, are dealing with that. Um, what we've done, in, in, and I say it gets better because despite all these challenges, we have a portfolio that is doing relatively well. Um, and part of that is we managed, I think we took the decision very early on to say that there are opportunities in the, you know, in the export space. Um, so we chose, made the decision strategically to back companies that were earning hard currency. Um, and that's done well for us. Um, increasingly, we're seeing opportunities in the textile space, garments and textiles, I should say. Um, we're also seeing opportunities in the business process outsourcing space. Um, and that will continue to be a focus um, for us as well. And of course, value-added exports in the, in the ag space as well are also interesting. So we've been looking at that, and that's done well for us, and I think that going forward, those are areas that we'll continue to look at. Wow, interesting. 
Um, before I go to the next person, let me just ask you your second question, Kwabna. Sure. So you mentioned textiles and garments. Mm. It's actually, interestingly, between Ghana and the UK, textiles and garments is a priority sector. Um, and I, I know your company has helped a number of um, smaller That's SMEs true. in exporting um, to Ghana. And by the way, with the trade between, in terms of trade between Ghana and the UK, there is a trade partnership agreement that gives Ghanaian businesses um, quota free access to the UK market and vice versa for Ghana. So then it means that um, if you look at exports, it, 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 it will really do well. Yeah? Yes. Um, so generally, there are a number of reasons why Ghana would make sense as a, as a hub for garments manufacturing. Chief among them, to your point, is um, you know the quota free access to the UK market, yeah. but there's also the AGOA arrangement with the US yeah. that allows you um, want to export garments duty free from Ghana um, into the US. Um, you also have the added advantage of being um, you know closer, so your shipping time if you, to the east coast of the US is significantly shorter than if you were um, you know coming from some part, other parts of you know Southeast Asia and what have you. So all of those things add up, where increasingly you are seeing. Um, businesses make the trip to look at the, you know, the possibility of exporting um, garments from West Africa generally, Ghana specifically. Some of you might have read about the um, the recent Arise um, hub in, in 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 Benin, but all of that is testament to what's going on in in the sub region. Um, and I think that for those, especially it's a, it's a priority sector for the government as well, because it's an interesting way and an um, way of creating jobs in large numbers. So if you're trying to create employment opportunities, um, the garments sector is one to look at. Um, and so yes, for businesses that or investors that are looking for where they can potentially unlock value, I'd say it's an area to look at. Could you add a few? A few more sectors before I go to. Germany. Oh, sure. Um, I, I mentioned the um, the business process outsourcing okay. space as well. Um, again, we're seeing um, a, a number of investments into that space recently. I think one of your related institutions, BII, through the Growth Investment Partners, invested okay. in an eSAL, um, in, which is one of the BPO pl platforms in Ghana. I think that that's that's one worth looking at. Um, Another th area, I, we've, we've invested in a, and I know that the cocoa prices are doing what they're doing, but we've invested in a, a, a chocolate manufacturing business that is exporting into Europe as well. Um, this is organic, um, fair trade plus chocolate. So you can also charge a premium for it. Um, consumers are becoming more savvy. They want to, to consume things, they know where it's, coming, where it's coming from, they know it's organic. So it's done well for us. I think that the opportunities in that space as well. Um, yeah, so those are a few sectors that I would say personally I would look at. Thank you, Kobna. Yep. Over to Jeremy. So um, I'd like us to look at the FinTech um, sector. Ghana is doing so well. It's catching up on the rest of Africa in terms of investment flows. So yes, um, it's also a priority sector for us. Um, I think Nigeria is leading, yeah. But we wish to catch up soon. I'd like to know what interesting opportunities there are in the space. And in terms of regulatory um, environment, are there any challenges? Are there easy ways of you know, growing, expanding, or starting up as a FinTech in Ghana? Sure, thanks. So I think, as you mentioned, the fintech space, I mean, generally it's considered that fintech is the future of finance. And we say that MSMEs or SMEs are the backbone of any economy. Well, fintechs are the ones who are basically trying to make sure that it's easy for them to operate and, and to be sustained. I think generally across Africa, the leaders are, we call them the top four. So Egypt, Ni Nigeria, um, South Africa, Kenya. Yeah. And Ghana is always there as number five. So even with the global you know, reduction in fund flow, we still saw that majority of the investment that came in went to fintech. 50% of the funding that comes into the digital economy goes into the fintech space. Jumo, for example, works with large banks and mobile network operators to grant access to finance 
to the un, un, underserved or unserved. Um, what we are doing right now is disbursing 1.1 billion um, Ghana CD and loans on a monthly basis. And even with that, the telco partner that we're with, MTN, says we are doing less than 10% of their eligible base. So the issue or the, the challenge there is not one of, of demand, it's one of supply. There's, massive, there's a massive gap. We now have the technology, we now have the financial institutions that understand the space that are looking to grow. Um, but you see that as they are onboarding new customers, you also have to make sure the capital available is there to supply, and that's what the gap is. Um, most of the challenges that fintechs face across the continent generally typically have to do with regulation or immature regulatory environments, mm. infrastructure like identification, and then just the understanding of this new sort of industry and phase. I think Ghana is quite lucky in the sense that we are one of the few countries that has a regulator that actually has a dedicated fintech and innovation department that is actually issuing out licenses and innovating themselves. Ghana's Bank of Ghana, or Bank of Ghana has done fintech hackathons, sandboxes. They are investing in regulatory technology and supervisory technology. So it's so much easier for a fintech to get licensed legitimately under the watchful eye of the regulator. And it's, it's we, I think it goes with, it's, it's an understated um, fact. The fact that you even have somebody in the regulatory office to speak to about fintech um, in Ghana is quite um, undersold. Um, the next thing is things like the identification. Now with the Ghana card, it's so much easier to clean the data that you have and identify if you're doing digital loans or micropayments, who exactly you're giving these loans to. It's a big solve that was a big pain point, or it's a big pain point across the continent. And it's one thing that allows us to scale even faster because the identification is there, the regulator is supporting you. And I think the largest, biggest opportunity is that we have one of the youngest populations across the continent, right? The mean age for a Ghanaian is 20.9, so you have about 60% of the population under the age of 26. These are the, the digital, um, or the tech-savvy, digitally hungry uh, population that do want to do things on their mobile phones, and their, their, their perception of the best customer service is self-service. They want to be able to access a loan, make payments on their phones, and that, you know, ties in exactly to what FinTech is there to solve. So the opportunity is vast, and again, like I said, it's not about um, an issue of demand, it's really an issue of supply, so the opportunities are quite vast, at least in the FinTech space. Thank you, my next question will be on financial inclusion. Mm. Um, how deep are you penetrating? And um, are there, is there space for other financial products like insurance, um, that, tech or digital means? 100%. I think that we are sort of a mobile lender or it, uh, lend tech in the, that domain of fintech. And even with uh, an, a small company like Jumo, so to speak, we are onboarding about 4.6 new customers every minute. Of the customers that we are onboarding, about 70% of them are first-time borrowers. They've never accessed a financial service product, either savings, credit, or investment. Oh. They are, you have 33% of them who are MSMEs, so micro SMEs, tabletop sellers. And this is just the first phase of what we are trying to achieve. There's so, so many more financial services that they don't have access to that is an opportunity for so many other large players to come in to serve, like I said. Even with all that we are doing, that one telco is saying you're not doing even 10% of their eligible base. So there's a base that has been sort of uh, scored and have been deemed to be eligible for financial services, but there's not really the financial service to, to serve them. So there's a lot of opportunity in the insure tech space, in the lend tech space, in the, there's so many domains of fintech that have not been explored, but okay. Ghana is you know, fertile ground for innovation, investment, all the three I's. Wow, thank you for that. Well, we were partners for the 3i Africa Summit. It's a tech, fintech, digital um, conference that happens, uh, that is to happen every year, started this year. <laughs> anyway, so my next panelist is Michael Akefia. I want us to talk about um, opportunities. Um, being a lawyer, being an investment enabler, I'd like you to touch on the opportunities and a bit of local content laws. Um, seeing that we have um, investors, foreign investors in the room, it would be good for you to touch a bit on our local content law and how it's fair and, and how it it's, um, supports growth of your business or your investments in Ghana. Thank you, thank you very much, Sarah Adelaide. 
I think people look at things like local content on the face of it and say that it sort of contradicts the whole drive towards getting foreign direct investment. But if you look at the way in which it is done, it is done deliberately and intentionally in certain strategy sectors so that it's, it's not cross-cutting, it doesn't cut across industries. So you have it in, in the energy sector, petroleum, and then mining. And it's particularly necessary because over time it's been sort of determined that you need to cultivate local champions, you need to create the space for them to develop. So the way in which the law is implemented is a gradualist approach on an incremental basis. And then where there is no capacity locally, the idea is to still insist on partnering uh, foreign investors and so on. So the approach to implementing this um, has been that the regulator has been issuing what you call the local procurement list, using, say, the mining sector as an example. And what they've been doing is that they've been adding onto the list only to the extent that there's capacity locally to supply to the, the industry. And so that has been one of the ways of doing it. And one of the things about it is also that the, you know, you look at even multinationals like the ones that I work for have always ahead of even legislation coming into place been as part of their ESG commitments, been looking to do more of local um, procurement to ensure that there's more value generated in the communities that we operate in. So that itself is self-induced. And sometimes we put more pressure on ourselves than even the regulation does. And so for us, if you look at even our financial report and the big chunk, two thirds of it is dedicated towards good stories like one that allows for local participation and so on. And so the other thing about it is that you find that in terms of sometimes the rhetoric that you hear about, say for instance, res natural resources and so on, there's over, over concentration on the equity space without appreciating the maximum amount of value that can be generated from the input side into the industry. And that's one of the things I say. If you ask the question, what's the big difference between, say, the mining industry in Ghana and, say, that in mature markets like South Africa and Canada and Australia, you don't have government participation equity, but rather it's a value of what is generated. It's more of the input side and how value is added locally. And so for us as a country, that's where the drive is, and that's what is the underpinning philosophy behind local content. And that's how it's been implemented in the way that ensure. The other dimension to it is a social piece. I mean, most businesses like us have what you call, you know, foundations, your corporate social responsibility vehicles where you use that to try and link up in terms of what we call shared value. The idea of shared value is to ensure that people in the locality and the host communities are able to participate they feel that they have a stake in what is happening. And so you try and link that to the input side so that hopefully we are trying to build capacity. The Chamber of Mines have, you know, over time commissioned studies. And the good thing about, say, some of the industries like we have, like in the mining sector, is that we don't compete for market share. So we can work collaboratively to ensure that we use our buying power to generate value locally. So it's, it's managed in a way that is not, you know, wholly against the whole drive towards bringing in FDIs. Where we need capacity and we lack local capacity, FDIs are always welcome to complement what locally can be generated. Thank you. Thank you. You touched on ESG briefly. Um, I'd like to know what the uptake is like. Um, I know for sure a few years back, it wasn't so much of a big deal for, for a lot of companies in Ghana. How is it being done um, now? How are companies implementing or putting into action ESG principles in okay, their so, business. Yeah, so there are two key possible uh, pressures, you know, um, having companies push towards their um, increasing their ESG commitments. You have the fact that investors, some of the biggest investors in the world, are dwelling on that and insisting on that as a precondition for investing. So you have the Black Rocks and the types of this world actually indicating on their website that they only invest in businesses that are tuned with current principles on ESG. So that's one of the drivers. And then the other dimension about it is the financial reporting. IFRS standards <laughs> require for that to be incorporated in the reporting process. Of course, long before that, you had all this, you know, governance, corporate governance experts like, you know, um, pushing for what you call the triple bottom line reporting where 
dimensions of a report, in fact, the two thirds of it I say these days, is dedicated to ESG and other communities. So the, you find that Ghanaians, Ghanaian businesses, especially those of us in the extractive sector, have put it on top of our agenda. And you would find that every meeting, every performance assessment focuses on that. Every engagement with investors, global investors, dwells a lot on our ESG commitment, reducing our carbon footprint, diversity and in inclusion programs and all of that. So that even the whole idea of local procurement is an element of the social piece of ESG. So it's something that's alive and well and can only increase over time. And you can f you, you find that more and more companies, even SMEs, because the way it works is that we take it on board. And what we do is to ensure that all of those are stakeholders, suppliers, all the nice. different kinds of suppliers down the value chain also imbibe those whole principles so that they also cascaded through, hopefully, the entirety of the economy through that sort of approach. So I think it can only get better as we go along. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for those insights. So I'll move um, to Mr. Owusu. Um, I'll ask you just one question so we could allow um, for questions from the audience. Um, I think I didn't see um, you anything in the presentation you did on transitioning you know, would you want to tell us about your plan for transitioning um, to renewable energy or safer energy? How, what is the plan? I think that it wasn't in the presentation. It would be good to have an idea um, that yes, this brilliant um, project we have, it's a legacy for all Ghanaians, maybe for all Africans, but um, how are we positioning it? to meet what is global standards? How, uh, what, what is the plan? All right, thank you. So I think it was there under the sustainability okay. with respect to the petroleum hub. So under the sustainability approach, I spoke about two pillars. You realize that we have what we call the hub group. The hub group, we're trying to plant trees. You know, the 20,000 acres of land, instead of building bricks and mortar, we're going to use trees to cover the entire land. So we're looking around 300,000 to 500,000 of trees, which we've, we've, we are in discussion with Forestry Commission to even give us the type of tree that will help us uh, achieve this sustainability. So that is one. If you look at the, the power plant in terms of energy, the, the 1,000 to 5,000 megawatts is going to be a gas-fired uh, power plant, which is going to use gas, which is then the transition fuel now. We're going to have renewables within the commercial and the residential area so that this, the power plant will feed on the heavy stuff, which is the refinery and the petrochemicals. And then once you, you come out, the whole country launch its energy transition and investment plan at COP28 in Dubai. The president led that. So the plan now is by 2060 is what we're going to transit. And I think it has a, a, a value amount of 550 billion US dollars, wow. which the hub is inclusive of that. So there's the country um, um, energy transition investment plan already okay. that has been launched. And I think we are the first in Africa to have launched our energy transition plan. And then when you take the hub to, there are so many things that we're doing to also ensure. If you look at the infrastructure, we are building five petrochemical plants. It's strategic. You know, we have three refineries and you have five petrochemical plants. Now, we are all saying gas is the transition fuel. So when we get to, let's say, in Ghana's case, that we want to transition, that's the just transition in 2060, all we need to do is to configure the three refineries to top up yeah. to the five petrochemical plants that to do hydrogen. So if you look at the existing hubs, like Houston, Singapore, and Rotterdam. That's what they are doing now. Mm -hmm. They are trying to configure some of their refineries to be able to embed it in hydrogen and all of that, just to be aligned with the current campaign. So there's a plan for Ghana, which I've spoken about, which we can all download it, the Ghana Energy Transition Investment Plan, and also the plan for the hub. So I don't know whether that addresses your concern, Sarah. Yes, it does. Thank you very much for that um, submission. At least we have a little commitment there to do right by a certain um, time. I'd like to open the floor for questions from our audience. Yes. Okay. 
Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Samuel. I work with Western Premium in Ghana. We are a fiscal asset management and maintenance company. Um, my question goes to Michael, um, and it's basically on uh, the local content conversation that we keep talking about. Um, when we come to his industry, specifically in uh, mining, we've realized and passed from experience that intentional efforts has been made to make the industry expensive deliberately, in my own personal view. And if you look at if today you want to work within the mining industry as a new player who wants to contribute to the local content, um, you go and you want to register, talk of the Chamber of Mines or the Mineral Commission, we are talking about five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. And um, it's very expensive for new businesses that want to contribute their quota with their local teams based in Ghana. How, how are you also saying that you're contributing to local content? Meanwhile, to participate in it is very expensive, is it? an intentional effort to make it an affluent sector, or what would you say about that? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Michael. Well, so you thank you very much. Actually, one of the interesting things about the mining industry is that it, it, it tends to be a dollar-denominated <laughs> ecosystem, so that's part of it. But actually, the, these concerns have come up, and the regulator, the Minerals Commission, has nothing to do with the Chamber of Mines. We are private <laughs> business association. Um, the chamber, the, if the Chamber of Mines itself raises those concerns with the Minerals Commission, one of the things they've accepted to do is to reduce the rate for local, local entities when they um, apply to um, register with them as uh, what they call mine support services. So there's a reduced rate. I mean, I think the, the, that headline thing about the prohibitive rate was, came up very strongly, but over time it's been reduced, so we can engage after and I'll con confirm to you. The other th dispensation that Minerals Commission does for local content providers is that, that when, they, when it comes to them, say, bidding for contracts, all they need to have done is put in the application. They don't need to have paid the amount for them, for us to consider them. Well, the next level is for the Minerals Commission in co collaboration with the Chamber of Mines to de develop what they are calling a database for all mining companies to become aware of, especially for local, con local players, to allow them to register ahead of the payment of the fee so that then they get a foot in even when you are doing your competitive business or restrictive tendering so that they're able to participate. So we can engage and find ways of avenues for addressing that. That came up because, you know, in theory, you know, all kinds of other mine support services, even those providing the most menial of services, are required to register, but they've come up with a dispensation which addresses those in that category. So I think we can discuss it and see how we position <coughs> that going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have someone. Question? Okay. We'll come to you shortly. And we have less than five minutes to wrap up. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, my, my question's for Jeremy, actually, which is I, I'm quite young, just like yourself. And um, I, I noticed that you know, you're, you're dealing with fintech. And um, so my main question is, how are you dealing with competition? Um, is, is there, I mean, Africa's a huge market, right? And it's one of the biggest markets there is. How exactly are you competing with the existing dominant markets or, or companies that there are uh, that operate within Europe and the US? Uh, particularly, for example, you know, I'm young, I'm 26, and I use Revolut mm. pretty much every day. How are you competing with that? How are you bringing Jumo into the African markets? Uh, and how are you going to deal with that competition threat, really? Sure, I think that's a really good question. I think that, like you said, the African market is large, but it's also very unique and it's also very nuanced. Going from country to country, you begin to find that it's a different ecosystem, even if you have two bordering com um, countries. So the same sort of solution and approach you would apply in Nigeria will not apply or will not necessarily apply in Ghana. So the approach that fintechs take is to think global, but to act local. So you think about the global best practices, what has worked generally internationally, why 26-year-olds are using Revolut, and then think of the 26-year-old Ghanaian to say, what, which elements of that can you apply? 
Is it the ease of use? Is it the user friendliness? Is it the fact that it, the interfaces mimic what they see on social media? And then bring that to a 26-year-old Ghanaian in a, in a village like Sesiriasu and realize that that does not ac actually apply. But they still want the same speed. They still want the same ease of use. But their channel is probably not a mobile application. Maybe it's a USSD that is a you know, star 170 short code. It still gives them the same elements that the global um, comp competitors present, but it localizes it in such a way that you are connecting with the, the user on the ground. The other big players that we tend to compete with are the banks, where people feel like fintechs came in to compete with the banks. But you begin to realize that it's more of a collaboration that is going to be the way forward. So what we try to do is not sell, us, sell ourselves as a player that is coming in to replace them, but a player that is coming in to enable them to access the segment of customers that they previously could not access. So it's a multi-layered approach, but it's trying to be as realistic as possible given the, the market segment that we're addressing versus staying cognizant of what is global best practice so that we, like I said, we act local, but we think globally. Hope that makes sense. Okay. We'll take the last question here, and then we will wrap it up. Okay. Hello? Yes. Good day. Jumo, I think this question is actually for you, and I'm just taking it from the word, your statement, that the telcos were telling you, despite the success you have achieved so far in fintech, you are just crashing it at just about 10 percent. And uh, to me, I think that's the cause for action that's why the 90 percent is still pending. And that's a good source of uh, investment, so to say. But um, from our experience, there's a difference between, I mean, the fintech being a channel of banking to being having a mobile money. I think you understand better. We have, a, we have in Kenya, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have a high uh, I mean, uh, financial inclusion but through the model of a telco-led uh, mobile money application, whereby money is being digitalized. But just like Nigeria and Ghana, some of us are afraid of going to that model. What is our operation? Why? Because that will have opened up so much uh, opportunities, so to see, and we'll have covered enough ground. Thank you. Okay. I, I so, think Jeremy, seconds, if you could just... <laughs> in 60 seconds. seconds or less. I think that that's a, a brilliant problem that you've highlighted. I think that one, mobile money is basically creating the rails, and mobile money is not the length and breadth of fintech. It's the responsibility of fintech players, investors, to come in and solve the, 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 uh, the underserved base. So we are trying to do one domain, which is mobile lending credit. But there's investtech, there's, there's so many different domains that need to be solved. And that is why the problem is not um, the demand is the supply, and there's a large gap. So it's one of the sectors where we actually welcome competition as opposed to push it away, because it's not, it's not dominated by any specific player. So, okay. yeah, and I mean, we can co keep the conversation going after. Right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you to our esteemed panelists. Um, we're still around. We'll be around tomorrow. We have a desk um, on level minus three. Please pass by, um, interact with us, get all the information um, you need on investing in Ghana, on doing business in Ghana. Thank you very much once again.